Welcome to another edition of P.P. Simmons Radio, your host, Carl Gallups. My guest this afternoon is Mike LeMay, a brother in the Lord, a good friend of mine. He's also the host for Stand Up For The Truth radio program, heard on Q90.1, as W-O-R-Q 90.1 out of Green Bay, Wisconsin, uh, Q90 FM. His co-host is Amy Spreeman. That's Stand Up For The Truth. Uh, They have uh, a national and international audience now, and the popularity of that show is just going nuts. His show and his commentary is often featured on the P.P. Simmons News and Ministry sites. And on top of all of this, Mike LeMay is the author of a tremendous book, one that you must have for your library. I have it. I've read it. It's in my library. I refer to it often. And as a matter of fact, that's one reason I asked him on the show, because I'm going to get him to tell you about the book. But also, I'm going to talk about a particularly uh, thought-provoking chapter in his book uh, that I think you'll find interesting. But the book's title is The Suicide of American Christianity. Mike, welcome to P.P. Simmons Radio. Great to be with you, Brother Carl. Thank you so much. Well, it's always a pleasure to have you on, Mike, and uh, you and Amy are just great warriors for the truth. Your radio program, Stand Up for the Truth, is just going crazy, and and I've had the great honor of being on it several times. I, it's one of my favorite, it, well, it is my favorite show that I do, other than my own, but I do a lot of interviews, and I just, I just love being on the show with you guys, because y'all are just not afraid to speak the truth of the Word of God and to apply it to the culture, and uh, boy, there's a, there's a real need for that, and you guys do an excellent job job of it. Well, thank you, Carl. We appreciate it. We love having you on every chance we can have. Well, thank you, Mike. Listen, uh, before we get going on the question I wanted to ask you for the, the reason that I had you come on, first uh, tell us uh, tell us about your program, uh, websites, uh, your blog, uh, how to get to, uh, how to listen live, and then tell us about your book. Well, the show is on 9 a.m. Central, Monday through Friday. You can go to StandUpForTheTruth.com and listen live, or every show is podcast there, StandUpForTheTruth.com. The book, The Suicide of American Christianity, can also be ordered there at StandUpForTheTruth.com, or you can go to Amazon and purchase a copy there. Okay, fantastic. Give, give, just give us a quick overview of your book, The Suicide of American Christianity. Very thought-provoking and even provocative title. Uh, tell us basically what it's about and uh, how it lays out in its research format. I watched my mother slowly kill herself over 30 years with alcohol and tobacco, and her death, set, or her death uh, certificate said liver uh, poisoning, but in reality it was suicide. And I started thinking about how the American church is basically by ingesting secular humanism and secular culture, slowly killing yourself. And I try to point out in the book ways we can stop this and return to the purity of God and his word. Yeah. Well, and, and, and your book does an excellent job. And as I want to remind or tell our listeners, you know, I, I've read the book. It's a catalog. It's a wealth of information and uh, thought-provoking material about what's going on in the Christian culture today. You've done a lot of case studies and personality studies of, uh, of uh, intriguing personalities within the Christian world today. So it's just a must-have book, folks. Please pick up this book, put it in your library, share it with others, The Suicide of American Christianity. Well, Mike LeMay, I had you on today as our guest commentator about a particular topic that's especially near and dear to my heart, and I know it is to yours as well because uh, uh, you write about it in Chapter 5 of your book, The Suicide of American Christianity. That, cha- that chapter, I believe, is entitled Satan's Pawns. And, and the premise of that chapter, and I, I'm just going to throw the question out and let you answer it uh, because I know you're the expert in this. Uh, you're the one that, that wrote the book on it. But, uh, but in, in your opinion, uh, you believe that Christians are just in today's culture, in, in the Christian community, you believe that many Christians are playing right into the hands of Satan by not contextually and properly and consistently reading and studying the Word of God. Uh, tell us about that. Well, first of all, we have a church over the last three years, a progressive Christian church, that tells us that when Jesus' uh, apostles asked, when will you return, that Jesus said, it's none of your business. And, of course, Carl, we know the exact opposite is true. Jesus gave them signs of the season to look for. And, And Christians, as we draw away from God's Word and put our eyes on the world, look at the mess we've got ourselves into. We'll believe any scientific theory put out by the science community without checking it against the Word of God. So we have a growing number of Christians who are trying to meld, uh, uh, you know, creation, as you so wonderfully put out in your book, uh, with evolution. So we've got evolutionary Christians. You know, we're buying into secular psychology, 
and I love writing about this, when we're in a bad place, we want to go instantly to a good place. So we drug ourselves, we medicate ourselves, we go to our local shrink. But in God's way of doing things, Carl, he takes us from a bad place to a worse place before he heals us, and that's called spiritual brokenness. But we live in a time when we want everything instantly. Give me that drug that's going to get me out of depression. Instead of letting God take me down to the lowest level necessary for me to realize I have nowhere to turn but him. Right. And when we do that, that spiritual brokenness, God then relieves the pain of that depression and hopelessness hopelessness that we feel. So we're always into shortcuts these days as Americans instead of letting God do things methodically the way he promises us he will do in the Bible. Yeah, and Satan has his pulpit, doesn't he? I mean, between public school systems, television, movies, games, I mean, he's got his bully pulpit. Oh, he does. I mean, you look at the National Education Association, the teachers' union, and I encourage people to go to NEA.org and look at what they're really trying to teach our children. It is based on a model of secular humanism and God-hating, and yet we send our children off to public school and don't worry a thing about it. If you are sending your children to public school, first and foremost, stop it if you can and find a good Christian school or homeschool. But if you can't, be aware of what they're learning about science, American history, and, and philosophy, because it is an exact 180-degree turn from what God teaches us these things are all about. Yeah, and, and we really also have developed a, a, a nanny state mentality, a, a um, uh, uh, what, what's, what's it called when you depend upon uh, the government for all of your help, uh, an entitlement mentality. That's the word I was looking for, and, and that kind of plays into all of this too, right, right into the Christian community as well. I think you speak about that in, in that chapter. Oh, we do. We are, we are so anxious to put our head in the guillotine. We're turning to a federal government <clears throat> to provide for our, rec- our retirement, our health care, and even our work. And this is a federal government that is growing increasingly hostile toward God and his word. Uh, the, the Homeland Security Department came out two years ago and listed white, born-again Christians um, as the, the top terror threat to this nation. So we're continuing to mortgage our future, depending on a corrupt ever increasingly corrupt federal government for our health care, for our mortgages, for our retirement fund, instead of, again, taking godly principles to to living in an economic world. It's it's coming, and Christians, it it amazes me to this day that more than half of born-again Christians have twice voted for a socialist for president. I don't know how else to say it, but we voted for a socialist, a Marxist for president, because, again, we want the government to take care of us. Yeah, we, we voted for a radical, outspoken socialist uh, of whom we know very little about his background. I mean, really, and, and, and you're right, and a lot of Christians either voted directly to put him in office or, even more shamefully, in my opinion, they didn't vote, they didn't get engaged, and therefore the man went in by default. And so now we have this culture, and, uh, and Christians, some Christians are sitting around in their churches complaining about the culture, the godless culture in which we live. The one they either voted in or refused to vote against. It, it, it's so sad, and when I meet someone who says, well, I didn't vote, I say, then you're part of the problem. That's period. right. <laughs> Absolutely. It, by not voting, you really did vote, actually. You, in fact, by not voting, that was a guarantee that you, uh, that you put him in. Well, listen, you spoke so brilliantly a moment ago about this uh, tendency for Christians to meld uh, evolution, so-called science, I call it pseudoscience, uh, to meld evolution pseudoscience with the Word of God, with Christianity. And, and, but there's also a very dangerous, disturbing trend in the church today, which you catalog beautifully in your book, and that's the tendency of Christians and pastors to meld Islam with Christianity. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about that. Well, 1 John chapter 4 clearly defines Islam as a religion of Antichrist because it denies Jesus Christ, the Son of God, come in the flesh. But over 300 churches every year spend time reading on a Sunday from the Bible and the Koran, and they're reaching out to, to Muslim leaders to find common spiritual ground in a religion of Antichrist and the one true religion through Jesus Christ. And, and you look at our secular media, Carl, how they will go out of their way to apologize for Islam, how they will go out of their way to not criticize Islam. I expect that of the world because it's blind to the ways of God. But when we as Christians, particularly our leaders, are promoting Islam as a religion of peace and tolerance, when the Koran itself basically says homosexuals are to be put to death, women who have adultery are to be put to death, 
we, we don't even take the time to understand the religion of the Antichrist. Instead, we open up our arms in the name of love and invite it in as part of Christianity. Even the Vatican, the, the Vatican, the Catholic Catechism, says that Muslims are saved because they believe in one God. So it is a great deception, one that is destroying our nation and bringing, uh, bringing great soil on the bride of Christ. Uh, brilliantly, brilliantly stated, Mike. Uh, in your book, and I believe, again, in this chapter, uh, you speak often of what you would probably describe as the greatest sin of all uh, in the Christian community among pro- the so-called progressive Christians. They're going out of their way. Uh, churches, pastors, denominations going out of their way, it seems, really to discredit the contextual truths of the Bible and to kind of meld uh, all religions kind of together as, as, as one. Uh, 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 the heresy of universalism. Address that for just a moment. Well, Carl, you, you as, a, as a student of the Bible realize, of course, that happened in Genesis in the Garden of Eden. It happened with the Tower of Babel where man will always try to elevate himself over a perfect, holy, just God. And now in the name of love and in the name of oneness, we as Christians are compromising with Hindus, Buddhists, Muslims, uh, lukewarm Christians, all in the name of love. But you know, Carl, you know this as well as I do, unless we truly know God and Jesus Christ, his son whom he sent, we can't even begin to define love. And you are seeing Christian, denom- every denomination, sects of them, basically compromising the truth and purity of God's word so we can have a quasi-love fest with the world. Yeah. And more and more... You're finding fewer and fewer pastors like yourselves who are willing to stand up for the purity of God's Word. And we have people that need leadership right now, and we just don't seem to be getting it in the majority of our pulpits around the nation. Yeah, well, you know, (laughs) I was going to address that, and then I thought, no, I won't. But then you did, so now I'm going to. (laughs) And that is... You know, Mike, I've been a pastor for 30 years, and there are other pastors out there like me and teachers of the Word like you who really stand in the contextual truth. But here's what I've learned. It's hard work to do that. Not only is it hard work, but you've got to study, you've got to pray, you've got to uh, keep your life pure, you've got to be in connection with God's Word. Then when you finally deliver the contextual truth, the culture doesn't want to hear it, so you're attacked on all sides. Oftentimes people in the church don't want to hear it because they're living in the sin that you're addressing. And so then the powers that be within the church begin to attack, and it becomes this hellish, hellish attack. And a lot of pastors... I think, have either cowered down or have just retreated into a shell of, of safety and comfort. And I, so we talk about Christians being Satan's pawns, but I think a lot of pastors are too, brother. Well, all of us who, who have been given the gifts of God to teach and to preach the Word, uh, a great responsibility comes with that, and we will be held accountable for that the day we stand before the Lord. And I often hearken back to Ezekiel, the call for the watchman, and it's not just radio hosts like you and I, it's pastors and all of us. If we... The watchman is told, if you do not warn the people of of pending doom and sin, their blood is on your hands. So we take it seriously. You know, Carl, one other thing I wanted to mention, I'm a big football fan, and if your your listeners watch football, watch at the end of a play, Team A member shoves Team B member. Team B member retaliates. Who gets flagged? It's almost always the Team B member. Those in the church that are breaking down true unity uh, of, of Christ and her bride when we push back against them breaking down that unity, we're often flagged as the ones who are divisive, when in reality we're calling for a true unity between the bride of Christ and Christ himself. Wow. We're pointing out how disunity is coming in, but just like in the football game, we tend to be the ones who get the flag the 15-yard penalty because we're retaliating when in reality, we didn't start this fight. We're simply defending the purity yeah, of God's yeah. word. Brilliant observation, brilliantly stated. And speaking of flagging for a penalty, we're out of time. I've got to flag you. Uh, we, we've got to go. But Mike LeMay, thank you for being on. We're going to have you back on P.P. Simmons Radio. This is Mike LeMay, my guest today, folks. I'm the host, Carl Gallup, P.P. Simmons Radio. Mike LeMay is the author of the book, Suicide of American Christianity. He's also the host of Stand Up for the Truth on Q90 FM out of Green Bay, Wisconsin, along with Amy Spreeman. Uh, Mike LeMay, thank you so much for being on P.P. Simmons Radio. Will you come back in the future? Anytime you'd like me, brother. I'm always honored to, uh, to share a microphone with you. Okay. God bless you. Folks, you have been listening to P.P. Simmons Radio, another edition. Your host, Carl Gallops. Stay tuned. We'll have more great radio for you in upcoming segments. God bless you.